lovely. Um, Sorry, I'm just pulling up uh, my notes for today. <laughs> um, okay, so before I begin, I would like to acknowledge um, that even though we are meeting through um, a virtual meeting today, um, I am meeting from the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nations. And I'd like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. Um, and any First Nation folks watching today. Um, also acknowledging that settlers um, colonism is an ongoing structure and that uh, sovereignty uh, was never ceded. Um, that there is no justice without First Nations justice. I would like to encourage everybody watching um, to pop in the chat uh, what land they are meeting from and uh, to make their own acknowledgement. So um, just to let everybody know um, that's watching today, we will be recording today's session. Um, we can provide a, a copy of the recording to you after the session today. So I would like to introduce myself. My name is William. Uh, my pronouns is he, him. Um, I've got black hair, uh, pale skin, um, brown eyes and medium build. Um, and I'd like to introduce uh, quickly Miranda and Mary, um, which are both um, from CIDA today. Um, Miranda will be helping with the facilitation and Mary will be in the chat um, putting useful um, information, helpful links um, and helping answer questions um, anybody may have through the chat function. So CIDA is the national representative uh, organization for children and young people with disability. Uh, Put simply, it's CIDA's job um, to make sure that governments are listening and responding to the needs, strengths and voices of children and young people. Also, um, just a quick reminder that CIDA will be sending out the presentation to everybody attending today um, after the presentation has finished. Um, just to let everybody know about the support that CIDA will be providing during today's um, webinar. Um, we will be talking about the NDIS. Um, I want to acknowledge that some of you in the session um, may have had some distressing or um, experiences with the NDIS. Um, if today's session brings up anything um, for you that may distress you, there is a free hotline called Blue Knot um, who can be offered to support you. Um, their number is 1800 421 468. Um, Mary, if I could, I'll ask you to put it into the chat function if possible. Um, so we will also, as I've said, um, we will provide the slides to you at the end of the presentation. Um, if you need to take a break, please feel free to step away from the device you are using. Lovely. Um, Miranda, if I could get you to open the slideshow. Thank you so much. Um, so Um, so the key terms um, that will be used in the session today, um, I just wanted to quickly run through them with all of you so I can sort of give you a little bit of an idea of what kind of information we will be covering today. Um, so 
the I'll give you an explanation of who we're talking about. So the NDIS um, is short for the National Disability Insurance Scheme. Um, this is the program uh, that providers with um, sorry that provides people with money um, to purchase the supports they need. Um, and the NDIA, which is the National Disability Insurance Agency. Um, this is the government department uh, that is in charge of the NDIS. Um, they make the rules and the final decisions um, about things uh, such as who can access the NDIS and how much money people can get from it. So here's a bit more of um, background information on today's session. So the NDIA uh, wants some big changes um, to know how the NDIS works. Um, this includes uh, changes um, to the steps you need to take to get access to the NDIS, as well as changes to planning meetings and how your NDIS plan is formed. The NDIA um, releases three papers, um, which is on their website right now, um, that explains all the different changes um, they want to be made. Um, they are currently asking the community for their feedback on what they think about these changes. Um, and the feedback is due in two weeks time. So currently CIDA is writing to them to make sure that the voices of children and young people are included in the feedback. We want to also include uh, the voices of young people and I can't really emphasize on that enough. Um, because it's such an important center um, to get across to the, um, who we're talking to. Um, CIDA also wants you to know that we value when you share um, with us your thoughts and opinions um, to our um, body so we know how to make our work better. Um, we are currently um, we currently, sorry, <laughs> uh, have a survey asking young people about their experiences with the NDIS. Uh, we will use the responses from this survey um, to help shape uh, what we say when we provide our feedback to the NDIA. Um, When you complete the survey, you will have the option to leave your details um, for a chance to win a $50 voucher. Um, you can also give us feedback through an interview if you prefer. Um, if you choose to get an interview, um, we will provide a $50 voucher for you um, and your time. So the purpose of the session. The changes um, will impact you and other people with um, a disability who use or are trying to access the NDIS. Um, we want to let you know uh, what these changes will be about and uh, what they might mean for you. We also want to encourage you uh, to use your voices and to have a say about the changes that are happening. You can do this with our survey or by providing your own individual submission on the NDIA website. We also wanted to provide you the opportunity to ask questions about the changes. We'll do our best um, to try and answer everything um, that is asked in the comments section. Um, we uh, I mean, sorry, <laughs> words. Um, so you can ask um, a question at any time throughout the session uh, using the chat function. Uh, we will either um, answer them through the chat 
or read them out um, during the question um, and answer section of the presentation. So the session outline um, is going to be changes to access and eligibility, key takeaways and Q&A, changes to planning, key takeaways and Q&A, and then we'll finally wrap up the session. Um, I will now uh, pass it on to uh, Miranda for access and eligibility. Thanks, Will. I'm um, sorry, one quick thing to clarify because it had changed. Um, if you do have questions, there's a Q&A function down the bottom. Um, so best to use that rather than the chat function. That was a mistake on my side. But yes, you can ask a question anytime and um, we really encourage it. So thanks, Will, for that great intro. Uh, my name is Miranda. My preferred pronouns are she, her. I'd also like to acknowledge that I'm on the, um, the lands of the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation. And I'd like to pay my respects to uh, any elders, past, present or emerging who may be on the line tonight. Um, before I start, I'll give you a visual description. So I've got brown hair, it's pulled back um, and I'm wearing a white t-shirt with an orange pinafore dress over it and I'm wearing glasses. So access, oops, I'll change the slide, access. So when we talk about access, um, it's a word that some of you might not have heard before, but we mean access to the NDIS scheme. So pretty much you apply and then they say yes or no. And that process is calling uh, is called gaining access. So this first slide that I'll show you, this is the steps um, that show how you gain access once, okay, so I'll rewind, sorry. So the NDIA, the government are proposing that there'll be some changes made to how people gain access to the NDIS. And we're gonna step you through the changes, what's changing. So see that box that I've highlighted in the middle, the referral to the independent assessor, uh, step three and four and the independent assessment, they're new additions to the access process. So for those of you who have already gone through the access process and are an NDIS participant, you won't have done this before. But for anyone in the future um, who will apply for the NDIS, this is some new steps that they'll have to do. So I'll, I'll step you through it a little bit more. So what do you need to do initially when you're applying for access? Uh, the first thing you need to do is complete an access form and provide evidence of your disability. So evidence includes things like reports from your doctors and other health professionals. So for many of you who may have already applied for the NDIS and have been given access and are receiving funds from the NDIS, you would have done this. This, this isn't new. So um, this, this stays the same. I guess what is new is that once the changes happen, everyone who applies for the NDIS will have to do this step. In the past, there were some, um, some different groups of people who didn't have to do this step because they had a specific disability or because they were already on a program um, and the NDIS said, no worries, you can come through straight away. But they're changing it that everyone will have to do this step. Okay, so you've provided the evidence of your disability, um, you've demonstrated a diagnosis and you've demonstrated it's permanent. What happens next? You might say, have you met access yet? And this is where I say, not quite. So this is where a new step comes in. So I'd, I guess anyone on the line who has applied for the NDIS before, this will be completely new. You wouldn't have done this. So the new step in the access process is called independent assessments. And I'll, I'll warn you, I'm gonna throw some, um, some new, new words and new terms at you, but please feel free to ask questions if you get confused along the way. And I'll also try to step them out a little bit. So this new, new assessment called independent assessments, they look at something called your functional capacity. So everyone will have to do this step at some stage. This includes if you're already on the NDIS and we'll go into that a little bit more in a minute. So what is functional capacity? They're asking you to do this new assessment measuring your functional capacity, but what actually is it? So I guess in that first step where you provide evidence about your dis disability and your diagnosis, you're demonstrating that you have a disability. Whereas functional capacity looks at how your disability might impact your things, uh, your ability to do everyday things. 
So that's with and without assistance. So people have very different levels of functional capacity because it includes things like, uh, it also includes things like where you live and what supports you have access to and maybe the people in the life that can help support you. So I'll just rewind that a little bit. So you have a, uh, you, you have a disability and then that impacts the way that you do everyday things. But just because you have a certain disability, it doesn't mean somebody else with the same disability will have the same functional capacity because they might have more supports in their life that can help them do the everyday things or they might have less. So two people with the same disability can have a different level of functional capacity. That's a lot of terminology. So I'll keep going and then um, please feel free to, if, if that section didn't make sense, to put it in the Q&A and we can cover it a bit more in the Q&A, uh, in the question and answer time. So this new assessment that everyone will have to do at some point that measures, as I said, your functional capacity, what does it actually look like? What does this mean for you? So there'll be an assessment that's in four parts. It includes a conversation, an activity. So this can be um, just something like an everyday activity to demonstrate, I guess, um, the impairment your disability may have on the things you do, uh, a questionnaire, and then also three to four assessment tools. So the assessment tool that the assessor, the person who does the assessment uses, um, they'll choose the tool depending on how old you are and things like that. So there's different ones for younger children and then there's different ones for adults. Um, who will be doing them? So they're completed by independent allied health professionals. And I highlight independent because it means they're independent to you. You will not know who they are. It won't be able to be done by your doctor or your health professional. It'll be someone uh, who doesn't know you coming in and assessing you. Um, what else should we know about independent assessments? You can choose where they take place. So um, if you want it to be in your home setting, that's fine. They can come to your workplace or you can meet at a cafe or whatever, that will be up to you. And it's expected that they'll take about three hours to complete. Oh, some other things that, you, um, that might be worth noting too is that if you wanted to bring someone along to the independent assessment, you're allowed to do that. Um, if you decide that three hours is way too much for one day, you can also choose to do it over multiple days. And if there's some questions, you know, if for instance, you want your parent or your boyfriend or your girlfriend or your friend to help answer some of the assessment on your behalf, um, that's okay too. You can decide how much you wanna answer and how much someone who knows you answers to. So that's kind of what it looks like. Okay, so there's this new assessment. They're coming in and they're assessing your functional capacity. But what does this mean? What will they be doing with the results? So after that, you do your assessment, the results of your functional capacity. So again, that's like how you do everyday activities and, and whether or not um, your disability impacts your ability to do those activities. Um, those results will be, then be sent to the NDIA. Then NDIA will then look at your results and decide if you qualify for access to the NDIS or not. So just to make that clear, this new assessment will also decide if you get access to the NDIS or not. So that's quite new. You used to have to do one step and now there's two steps. In some instances, for some people, there'll actually be three steps. The NDIA might also ask you to provide some more information and evidence. So um, examples of this will be a history of what supports you've used in the past. So I hope everyone's following along. There's a new assessment that everyone who wants to access the NDIS needs to do. That assessment looks at a person's functional capacity and then whatever the results say about your functional capacity, then determine if you get access to the NDIS or not. Okay, some other things um, you should know about the independent assessment is that you will receive a copy of the results afterwards as well. So the, 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 the results of your functional capacity level, um, but that doesn't necessarily mean you'll get access. It just means you get to see uh, the results. Something very important, which I will explain um, later on, 
is the results of this new assessment will also shape your draft plan budget. So this is the amount of money you get to purchase supports, but um, I'll explain that more later. Okay, so that was a lot of information. We'll, what are the key takeaways? What are the things we should know before we move on? Thank you so much, Miranda. Um, so today, uh, from what uh, Miranda has told us about access and um, eligibility, um, so the key takeaways um, from uh, what she has just explained to all of us is uh, there is a new step in access um, process called um, independent assessments. Um, and the assessments uh, look at person uh, at the person's um, functionality um, and the capacity of it. Um, the outcomes of this new assessment um, will help decide um, if you can access the NDIS or not. Um, everyone uh, will need to do this assessment at some point including if you're already a part of the NDIS. Um, we will explain this in the next um, section of the presentation shortly. Um, they must uh, be completed by someone who doesn't know you, um, meaning it can't be done by a doctor you may know already or any other health professional um, you may have a previous relationship with. Um, so I'm just going to quickly highlight um, that there was a question asked in the Q&A section. Um, and the question was, uh, what are the qualifications um, of the staff uh, completing the in independent assessments um, that the person's presuming that they're occupational therapists and Mary Sawyer um, answered delightfully um, saying that the question would be asked during this. Um, so Miranda, I'll throw the question to you. Um, yeah, thanks Will and great question. So the, um, the professions, they're, they're currently recruiting at the moment actually. So you can go online and you can look on um, like seek.com.au and you can see the kinds of people they're recruiting for if you're interested but they've, uh, they're recruiting allied health professionals. So that does include OTs, but it's really, really broad. Um, they've said, you know, OTs, things like physiotherapists, um, like speech pathologists, that's all under the allied health prof like professional umbrella. Um, but it is something that we're, as a sector, as a disability community, keeping a really close eye on because it is important that people have the white right qualifications and um, yeah I guess we're really keen to know more and make sure that the right people are hired if these changes are going ahead so yes they said they'll hire allied health professionals and, and we'll be monitoring the kind of people that are hired thank you again Miranda um, so the next question that came in um, is uh, what happens if the functional assessment doesn't give an accurate assessment of your needs um, and you don't end up with uh, enough supports? This is um, a really good question. And I think this is where it's really complicated. So I guess one thing I'll make clear is we're talking about the NDIA these changes are not in concrete yet. So there's still time for us to push back if we don't agree with the changes. But I'm, I'm talking, I guess, assuming that they're going to happen. So assuming that these changes get made and, and then everyone will have to complete an independent assessment. If you're not happy with um, the outcome of your independent assessment, you can't actually appeal. Um, the NDI have made it quite clear that they won't be accepting any appeals of the independent assessment, that whatever that independent assessment says is locked in, it's con concrete, do you know what I mean? You can't, um, you can't change that assessment. What you can appeal though, and this is where you have a little bit of power, 
because the results from the independent assessment get sent to the NDIA, so that government worker, who then make the final decision about um, what supports you might need um, and if you make access or not. If, you don't, if you're not happy with their decision, you can call an internal review. And um, if you're not happy with that internal review, then you can take it one step further as well. So there's a little bit of power there that you can challenge the decisions that have been made about the results, but you can't challenge the results themselves. So it's, um, it's a bit tricky, that one. So I hope I answered that okay. Thank you again, Miranda. Um, the next question that came in, um, can somebody uh, be removed from the NDIS uh, once they already approved um, previously? That's also a really good question. Um, the short answer is yes, uh, we do think that people can be removed. So we're, we're really watching it as a sector because um, we understand it, it's incredibly stressful that there is a chance that some people might be removed. But because now you have to meet two access, you have to prove your disability and you have to demonstrate your functional capacity, uh, a level of functional capacity that um, meets access to the scheme, a person might not meet both anymore. So the NDIA might say, oh, you're, you've got actually quite a high level of functional capacity, despite the fact that you have um, disability and then it's permanent. So you don't need the access to the NDIS anymore. But you can also, things change. And I guess because functional capacity takes in your individual circumstances, obviously a person's life changes. So even though there is a chance that um, you might be removed from the NDIS, there's also a chance that you can come back to it at a different stage in your life when, when your situation changes. But yes, the short answer is it, it can impact who gets access and who already has access may no longer have access. Um, another question that came through Miranda is, uh, what happens if your child refuses to undertake the assessment um, because um, it is a person they don't know due to anxiety? That is a good question. Um, there are, and I don't have the list in front of me, I'm sorry, but there are um, two exemptions to who has to do the independent assessments. One was, oh, I should have the list in front of me, I'm sorry. One was if there's um, a risk. I'm seeing if Mary's put it in the chat, maybe. Uh, okay, if there's, um, I guess, any pre-existing trauma involved, so where it could be quite um, harmly for the person to do the independent assessment. And there was another exception where, um, oh, I've forgotten the exception. Sorry, it was quite narrow. There is a list. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure when we send out, because we'll send out the slides and that afterwards, I'll make sure those two points are included. Um, anxiety, it was, the, the definitions they gave were quite limited and, and it wasn't much information at all. And, and I, I've been in many sessions before where people have asked this same question, you know, how can we get exemption? Um, the NDIA, gave two reasons for exceptions and I'll email that out. But what I will make clear is it's up to the NDIA to determine if a person gets um, an exemption or not. Exemption meaning they don't have to do it. And you can't appeal the decision that the NDIA make about ex exemptions. So um, yes, sorry, uh, yes, sorry about that. Thank you, Miranda. Um, and I think we'll um, say this is the last question and then we'll move on to the next sec uh, section of the um, presentation. Um, do you have to pay uh, for your independent assessment? No, they are free. Um, the NDIA will pay for them, but um, in saying that, you can't ask for a second one or a different one. They'll only pay for the one. And then once that's it, that's like you don't get another chance. Um, 
again, uh, thank you very much, Miranda, um, for answering these questions from the Q&A to the best of your capacity. Um, and to Mary for um, guiding us through. Um, so I will now um, throw to Miranda to take you through the changes um, in the planning process. Thanks, Will. So I'll just get my slideshow. Oops. Okay, the planning process. So when I talk about the planning process, um, for those who are already participants of the NDIS, this might be familiar with you. It's when you, um, you've you already made access. So they said, yep, you can um, join the NDIS and you can get supports. And then it's figuring out what kind of supports you need and how much the NDIS will give you so you can purchase those supports. So this um, diagram in front of you, I know it's a lot of writing, so don't worry too much. I just guess I want to demonstrate this is what the NDIA have made. And these diagrams are online if you're interested, but it's quite different, the process. And I've highlighted step four. And again, don't worry too much if you can't read it or see it properly, because I will go through this properly. But step four is where you come in. So I guess I wanted to highlight that because step one, two and three all happen before you even get a say. So uh, I guess in the past, um, you know, the planning process, you, you meet with a local area coordinator or, or an NDIA planner, whoever you're working with, and you, you discuss your goals um, and, and what you, your aspirations. And then from there, you determine what supports you need going forward. It's pretty different now because that's already determined before you even start the planning meeting. So. With that, I'm going to go through it. And again, this is going to be a lot of um, a lot of info coming your way, but hopefully we can wrap it up tightly at the end and then ask some questions. So this term that I'll be using today, a plan budget. So this is um, pretty much the amount of money that the NDIA give you to purchase the supports you need to meet your goals. So currently your plan budget is decided after your planning meeting. This is changing. In the future, the results from the independent assessment will decide the size of your budget. This will happen before the planning meeting. So just to step that out a little bit, as I said, currently you have your planning meeting where you meet um, with the planner or the local area coordinator, you talk about your goals and your aspirations, and then you know provide some evidence and that information gets sent to the NDIA. And that's how your plan budget, which is the amount of money is, is decided. Now, you don't really get a say in how big the plan will be. Like your voice doesn't come into the picture until much later. So that independent assessment that I was talking about before that um, is now needed to grant access to the scheme, that will also decide the size of your budget. So it'll look at your situation um, and your functional capacity and the individual circumstances. And then they'll be like, yep, this person needs X amount of money to to get the supports they need. So as I said before, you could have um, two people with um, the same disability that have very different functional capacity because of their circumstances. So just because you have the same disability as the person next to you, it doesn't mean you'll get the same amount of money. However, someone with the same functional capacity, so similar circumstances um, and, and similar needs and, and need similar supports, you should be getting a similar level of money as them. So this, and I'll try to explain this a little bit more in the next slide. So as I said, the NDIA will look at your functional capacity. So it's one big picture of you, including your disability, but also where you live and, and, and the people in your life and, and supports and things like that. And they'll give you one package of reasonable and necessary supports. So one amount of money if that makes sense. Oh, oh, the next slide I think will help a little bit more. So for anyone who um, already has access to the NDIS, the, the diagram on the left, the first one, that might look a little bit familiar. So your plan consists of lots of little, well, lots of different reasonable and necessary supports for different things in your life. So they should be linked with your goals and aspirations. So you might have a reasonable necessary support 
budget for something like employment and then something else for transport and things like that. So lots of little ones. Whereas what's happening now, which is the picture on the right, is rather than having lots of little supports um, that are reasonable and necessary, they're going to give you one big package of reasonable and necessary level of funding. So there's a few other things that are changing with your funding as well. So um, at the moment, the funding is um, like when you get your reasonable and necessary supports, they're in the categories of, of capacity building, uh, core supports and um, capital supports. So those three categories, and it, it's quite fixed how you spend the money. So this is changing. Those three categories will no longer exist. Instead, there's going to be fixed funds and flexible funds. So you do independent assessment, the NDI look, and they say, yes, this person will need, I don't know, just say $80,000 for 12 months. When they give you this $80,000, some of it will be fixed and some of it will be flexible. So I'll go through that. So the fixed funds means it's money that the NDIA have decided you can only spend on certain things. So for example, when they give you your plan, your, your money, they'll say, you can only use this 10 grand to $10,000 to spend on employment supports. So that $10,000 has to be spent on that type of support, or it could be you know, a mobility aid or anything else. Whereas flexible funds, it's money that will be left over in your budget that you can spend much more freely. Um, so it doesn't necessarily have to be on employment support. It can be if you want, you can spend it on that, but you can spend it on really any disability related supports and needs. So just to go back a bit, the three types of supports that are in existing plans now, the core uh, capacity building and the, I always forget the third, sorry, cap capital, I believe, will no longer be a thing. Instead, your money will be given to you um, with fixed funds and flexible funds. So you might be asking if the plan and the amount of money for supports is already determined, what actually happens in the planning meetings? Because this is historically where, um, you know, where you decide, you know, you, where you tell them what supports you need and your goals and things like that. And this is actually something SIDE is really curious about um, hearing from you about because they've changed this quite a lot and they've really changed what goals mean in the planning process um, and they take on a really different purpose and we've heard um, so far in our survey from a lot of people that goals are actually quite important so we'd be interested to get more feedback to understand this and let the NDIA that you, you know they need to think carefully about changing um, what goals mean for people because for some people it's really important so anyway what will they mean in the current planning meeting so as I said they use that currently they shape your budget but in the new once the changes have been made they'll guide how you spend your budget so when you go to the planning meeting like normal you, you'll um, do your participants statement and you'll talk about your aspirations with your local area coordinator or, or the planner in the meeting and um, then they'll help you spend the funds that you've already been given to help meet these goals so we're not actually quite sure how strict they'll be if, if they'll make you write goals or, you know, if they'll really encourage you to do the process or if it's um, something that's kind of tacked on the end. We're not too sure about that. But, yeah, I guess the main takeaway is goals are no longer really important in um, shaping the budget, but um, that they will help you guide how you spend it. Some other differences that will happen in the planning meeting is um, you'll now be decided, uh, you, sorry, you'll now get to decide the length of your plan. So currently plans are generally 12 months, but now they can be up to five years long. Um, and you can, I'll, I'll highlight this one. So the length of the plans can, up to, can be up to five years long. What is important to note with this, these new changes is you will have to do a new independent assessment after every plan, if, especially if there's major changes anyway. So for instance, decide you want your plan to be three years long. 
after those three years, you'll need to redo that independent assessment where that person comes in and, and looks at your functional capacity. So um, we're, we're curious to hear if, if you think, you know, changing in the length of the plan is a good thing, if you're happy with that, or, or if you like having 12 months and, and um, refocusing on the next 12 months. Some other differences that are happening in the changing meeting is the release of funds. So um, pretty much it's just to help you budget, I guess, because you'll get a 12 month plan, but then they said, well, how often would you like those funds released to you to help you budget? So the examples that the NDIA gave are quarterly or monthly. So in short, this just means how often they'll give you um, the money so you can spend it. And then once that month's done, you get your next amount of money. Yeah. Um, and if you don't spend, so for instance, in May, you get a certain amount of money from your budget. If you don't spend that amount in June, it will carry on. So it's not like you have to spend all the money in the month, but it's just supposed to be something to help you. Um, something else that will be different too is the frequency of check-ins. So currently your local area coordinator or the planner that you um, work with uh, is supposed to check on you so often to just make sure you're doing okay um, that you're able to spend your money, that you're not having any problems. It's now up to you to decide um, how often you want these check-ins to be. So for some people, it might be a bit of a nuisance. So they'll say, oh, six, once every six months or once every 12 months is okay with me. Um, but some people might really like it when, they're, when their local area coordinator checks in so you can do it more often. So that's some of the other changes. Um, some of the things that will look the same is in the planning meeting, you'll decide how you want to manage your plan. So that looks like it'll be the same, whether you want to be self-managed or um, agency managed. And the other thing is the planner should also be in this planning meeting, directing you to um, supports in your community that can help you implement your plan. Okay, I know I gave you a lot of information, so let's break that down. And I'll... When I talked about the access process, um, I know that was only relevant, I guess, to some people. Some people already might have access to the scheme, so some of those steps you won't have to do. But this step will be for anyone who, who has access to the NDIS. Anytime you do a plan, this is what will have to be done. So step one, you do that independent assessment. So an allied health professional um, who you don't know will come into your home or whatever setting you choose and assess your functional capacity. The, the results from this independent assessment will then be sent to the NDIA, so the government. From the results, they'll decide if you, uh, sorry, how big, uh, oh, sorry, one other thing. They might, like the access process, they also might ask for more evidence and information as well. So for instance, um, if the independent assessment identified things like home mod modifications need to be done or you need some assistive technology and things like that, the NDIA are probably going to ask you for more information and evidence, which you'll have to provide. That won't be part of the independent assessment. So once they have the information from the independent assessment and the information from any extra evidence they've asked for, this will then decide um, your budget and how much money you get. And in this budget, there'll be fixed fund, funds. So that's the money that they've said you have to spend on certain types of supports. And then there will be flexible funds. So that's the, the funds that you can spend um, on just general disability related um, supports and needs. This is where you come in. So step one, two and three, they happen without you. This is when you get to come in. You get to see your budget before your planning meeting. So you'll have some time to consider what the budget says um, and you can show a family member or a doctor and get their opinion. Um, but yeah, so you have a little bit of time, but you can't really change it in the sense that you can appeal. You could like if you, the step two, you can, um, you can appeal or ask for a review of the decisions that the NDIA made. So for instance, when they looked at that extra evidence and things like that, you can say, well, actually, you know, you didn't look at this or this isn't enough money for the whatever. You can appeal the decision that NDIA made, but you can't um, appeal the results of the independent assessment, which will shape most of your budget. 
Okay, so you've got your budget, you've gotten time to consider it, um, and then you go into the planning meeting. So here is where you discuss your goals. So you talk about the things that are important to you and what you'd like to achieve. So then the, L, uh, the local area coordinator or the planner will help you um, decide how you want to spend your money so you can best achieve uh, those goals. And then in that planning meeting, you'll also decide those things I was talking about, like how long you want your plan to be, how long uh, you want in between the, ch the check-ins and um, how often you want to receive the money. So after that, um, the, the NDIA will look at it and, and, and approve it, and then you'll have a plan. So again, depending on how long you want that plan to be, um, could be one year, two years, up to five. But once that finishes, once that plan has expired and you've used the funds for those five years or whatever, you'll have to start the process again. So you'll be doing all those same things again. So yes, I'll go to Will, what's some of the things that we should absolutely know from all that information I just gave you? Thank you very much, Miranda. Um, so I will take you through um, the key takeaways which we gathered from that information that Miranda just gave us. Um, so as we know, the results from the independent assessments uh, will decide how much money uh, you will get for your support. Um, you will need to do a new independent assessment every time you get a new plan. Um, goals will no longer help decide what supports uh, will be funded. And uh, the final key point is um, you can decide how long you want your plan to be. So it can go up to five years, um, as Miranda mentioned. Um, so now we will um, do a QA. and a um, So a couple of questions came through in the midst of this segment. So I'll go to the first one. Uh, so the first question is, um, how um, from one assessment taking three hours, uh, can they decide uh, what their needs are? So uh, where it has taken professionals years to work out needs. Um, so this person is confused on how it's going to be fair. Yeah. Um, I guess I wish I could answer that, but we at SIDA have the exact same questions um, and I think the disability sector in general is pushing back on that that this three-hour assessment is kind of all-encompassing and supposed to take in all these individual circumstances but um, we're not sure that they will be able to so I guess it's not really an answer but I guess uh, I'm in, in agreement with you and, and we'll be definitely highlighting that in our feedback. Thank you Miranda. Um, so we've also got another question from an anonymous attendee. Um, so this person said, my child has selective mutism. Um, I don't know if I pronounced that right. So if I didn't, I'm sorry. Um, so not sure whether they will be able to communicate effectively with an independent uh, assessor. So they also, they're also transgender and feel like they'd be judged. Um, there's no way they'll have someone uh, check if they can shower or dress themselves. Thanks for that, Will, and thanks for the question. So um, I guess a similar question was asked in the, in the last section and Mary has since put in the chat, um, she sent me the, the exemptions I, I was trying to remember before. So the first one was, um, as I said, when risk and safety in, involved, either for the assessor or for the individual, if there's specific trauma related, related concerns. Um, and this is the second exemption. And I'll read it aloud because I guess in answering your questions, we're working off this information and um, it's quite vague. And I know this is quite stressful for a lot of individuals and families. And, the, and this is the information that we're working with. So the other exemption is um, assessment is inaccessible or invalid 
where they may be concerns about the process producing valid information and other sources and or forms of information are better suited. For example, a support person can't be identified to complete relevant components of the independent assessment. So it's still pretty vague. And, and I know um, a few of you in the, in the Q&A have mentioned specific disabilities. And to be honest, we're just not too sure. Um, and I think it's also really important that you highlighted the um, importance of, of um, gender and identity and how you, know, you need to be comfortable with the assessor. And this is something we're quite um, concerned with too at CIDR because it just hasn't been acknowledged. It's all, um, they talk about it all quite objectively, like, like you know, that rapport um, isn't important in these independent assessments, but I, I think we would push back on that. So again, sorry, I can't answer those questions, but um, I know it is a, a real concern in the community and we, we share those concerns. Thank you so much, Miranda. Um, so we uh, just wrapped up the um, Q and A um, on the dot of time. So I think I'll uh, move us on to the wrap up. Um, so if you could bring up the slide, Miranda, that'd be great. Um, so just to um, summarize what we've um, gone through together in um, all of this information we have given to you. Um, so we have discovered together that obviously um, the processes through the independent assessments will be changed. Um, and uh, some of NDIS's um, processes that exist now and may be changed um, further in the future um, haven't always looked at the accessibility side of things. Um, myself, um, as a person with lived experience of disability and also as the facilitator of this session, I can definitely agree um, the NDIS could um, do better with accessibility and inclusion of people um, who are looking to use um, the system. So um, I would love to thank everybody um, who has watched today's session. Um, we appreciate that you have taken the time to ask all of those um, marvellous questions and share your experiences um, with us on, you know, all of your um, situations and um, curiosity on how the system works. Um, so I would love to mention um, how important it is to um, hear from young people um, with disability and also everybody um, who wants to learn about the process. Um, we would love to um, we would love to thank everybody again. Um, and just a other reminder, um, before I pass on to Miranda, um, just to let you all know that we value all of your perspectives and all of your circumstances. And um, we would love to hear um, your um, experiences more um, with the survey that you could fill out. So um, Mary, if I could get you to put the survey into the chat or um, section again, thank you so much. Um, if everybody here who's listened to us could please fill that out, we would much appreciate it from Sada and myself. And I'll pass it on to Miranda to wrap up. Thanks so much, Will. Um, yeah, I guess I'll just reiterate that these are changes that the NDIA have proposed. Nothing's in concrete yet. Um, there are some things that we can assume they're steaming along with, but it doesn't mean we still can't have a voice and push back and have a say. So CIDA will be um, putting a submission in and, and it will be public. So it will be public in a few weeks time. Um, and I guess, thank you for coming tonight for your questions because they help us shape the submission. Um, I just want to reiterate though, the importance of that survey um, that we've got running at the moment and helping us gather the information, concerns of um, families and young people and how heavily we rely on making sure that we represent um, what needs to be said through this survey. So please, I really encourage you to um, share. There's a survey specific for young people. So if you have, uh, if you're online, um, please, please complete that survey. And then there's one for families as well. And, and please share it with your networks as well, because we're really trying to um, 
yeah, get everyone together and, and be loud together. So thank you. Um, I think that's it. Thank you so much for, for yeah, coming tonight and thanks to the captioners. And thanks for Mary on the chat. Um, yeah, so we will send the slides and I believe a recording to everyone who attended tonight's session. So thank you very much. <laughs>